Thompson uh, Bay is the northern limit of the range of horseshoe crabs in the entire world. No horseshoe crabs in Japan have a higher nesting place than ours do. So that makes them a remarkable colony, and the U.S. Geographic Survey has come and taken the legs off of 50 horseshoe crabs to genetically determine that it's a unique group that's separate from all other horseshoe crabs in the world. It's isolated, and it has been for thousands of years. Uh, and so I think the Bagadoo's friends probably are in the same boat. Probably those at the extremes of its range uh, are unusual. Down south, they all go out to sea in the wintertime. They go out to the depths and feed in the bottom, and they don't hibernate. And we didn't know where these guys went in the winter, because when they, they breed in a two-week period, and then you never see them. They're just gone. They're on the bottom feeding. And where are they? Um, so I was involved in a research project to determine whether they left the bay or not. And for two and a half years, I <coughs> monitored horseshoe crabs almost every day with sonar. We pasted sonar transmissions, uh, transmitters, onto the backs of 26 horseshoe crabs, 13 males and 13 females, in two different locations, Egypt Bay and Hong Bay. And then I went around, and it was great fun trying to figure out where they are. I put my sonar receiver down in the water and turned it around and see if I heard anything. If I heard a beeping, I would go in that direction. And we finally settled, we were going to triangulate and figure out where they were in three different set settings, but that didn't work. Because the sound just didn't travel far enough in the water. So we decided I would go as close to over the top of the horseshoe crab, so the signal in my ears was the loudest. And if I'm hard of hearing today, that's probably really <laughs> contributed. That and the sound of a rattly old motor on the boat. But Do they I love lobster traps at all. That not so they not they don't find them in traps to know where they're going. Right? I've never heard of one because they're. You see how broad they are, you know, something smaller can go through the funnel that goes into the trap. I've never heard of a horseshoe crab doing that. That's it. This is the global range of horseshoe crabs. There are three different species here in Southeast Asia, and I'll show you pictures. And one species, Lemulus polyphemus, from the Yucatan up, and the, right there is where Totten Bay is. And we were rivaling Japan, but Japan had constructed walls and built up their coasts, armored the coast, so that they no longer uh, have the record. And they all look slightly different. That's Carcio scorpius rotunda cauda. And that one, it looks really flat and streamlined. Tachyopleus gigas, giant. And Tachyopleus tridentatus. So those are the three other species. But they all look like horseshoe crabs, and probably to a casual observer, they would, you wouldn't see the difference. Then Limulus polyphemus is ours from the Caribbean up to us. So in Maine, these are places where they're known to breed, and they're down in Casco Bay in three places, and then in isolated spots. Then Penobscot Bay is a big gulf. And the water's pretty cold. For some reason, they don't like it around here in this coast. 
and then you get them in the Nagadoos, in the Salt Pond, in Blue Hill, uh, up here in Surrey, and then over here in Totten Bay. And that's as far as I know the ten sites in Maine where they exist, and this is the northernmost one in Totten Bay. Thomas Point Beach, that's more the sediment that, you know, a sandy beach that you'd expect them because down in Delaware, that's what they have. That's what they like for landing their nests. Look at these boulders, these rocks up here in Tottenberg. This is a hard neighborhood for them to populate. So my question when I was tracking them is why are they here? Why do they bother trying to breathe among all these rocks? And we distinguish one population in Egypt Bay and another in Harvard. And as a result of our survey, we never found one that was tagged here, down here, and vice versa. These are two separate populations. And this is the one you hear about that Franklin knows about. This is more private. That beach right there is where they breed. And people don't go to that beach except the people who do are wormers and clambers, and they know they're there. So that's the basic underside of a horseshoe crab. Its tail is very characteristic, and this one is deformed, it's usually straight. It has these evil-looking teeth on the back edge of its shell. These are the legs. There's one, two, three, four, five, and a little pair up there, six pairs of legs. These are the gills they breathe with, and they move back and forth like this, opening and closing like bellows. And this is a structural ridge that just adds strength to the leading edge of the shell. That's the tail is a telts on book gills, because they look like the pages of a book, walking leg. And that, you can tell walking legs because they look like that on the end. And the mouth is right at the leading edge of the ball of, and what they eat is young clams and young mussels. And they have the strength to crack them. And their back pair of legs is pushing legs for moving ahead. So here is the prosoma, or front body, is a hinge, it will actually <coughs> bend like that, and the opisthosoma is this middle area, and the tail, the telson, to the rear. And they're descended from trilobites, so they have three lobes, trilobite means three lobes, one, two, three. And they've been around unchanged for 450 million years. Because the conditions that support them and the food they eat hasn't changed all that much in 450 years. The land around them has changed immeasurably. But, uh, where they are, down in the mud, it's the same world. So they've pretty much had no motive for changing and streamlining and altering their shape. So here's one upside down and one on the top. Steve, is there a definite purpose for the tail? Is it help in reproduction or anything at all? It's used defensively. When it sticks straight up, you don't want to step on it. Uh, and it has 10 light sensitive areas along the length of the tail. So it, somehow, it probably can gauge when it's time to come out of hibernation by sticking the tail up. Because they bury themselves in the mud so they don't freeze. And yet they can move the tail. And, and I read about it and nobody really knows what the function is. And a lot of people pick them up by the tail 
and you it's easy to snap it off by putting pressure on it. So we ask people not to do that. So the mouth is up there, and there are the book fields up there. And this is a male, and these front claws look like boxing gloves. They're claspers meant to catch onto the rear edge of the female, so the male locks onto her during breeding, so she <coughs> won't get away from him. And she lay, she digs and lays the egg, and he fertilizes it. And then other orchard crabs come in uh, and form a menage of trois or others. Their eyes here and here and here. And there's, this is a poor, unfortunate creature. Epiphytes are creatures that latch onto their shells. And here, blue mussels are growing on the shell of this one, weighting it down so it cannot, it can only assume this posture. It's just weighted down. And I righted it up, but I didn't take the mussels off. Uh, and the eagles prey on horseshoe crabs, crows do. Killifish in the water, prey, raccoons, uh, seagulls if they have a chance. So they're part of the food chain too. And this one undoubtedly would be eaten by somebody. And you see how that pushing leg has fingers on it. It opens up like this so it can push on the mud. Whereas the others are meant for gripping and they only have two. And this is a male, so I have classroom. The leading edge of the lip here betrays their sex. This is rarely pronounced, and the males have that higher lift in the leading edge that goes over the back of the female so as to fit her. And so females have a lip that goes across down there. There's a little bit of a curve to it, but not much. You can see that's very pronounced. Male horseshoe crab. So the female, you see, isn't smiling like that. And you, you can tell them when you find one all by itself, whether it's a male or a female. Plus, the male has claspers, and that's a sure sign. And this is technically called, technically, the mating posture is called emplexus, where he is actually gripping her shell with his graspers, with his claspers. So they look like that. That's a mated pair of horseshoe crab. And they mate. And they look like that for about two weeks in early May, late May, early June. They have three behaviors. They travel like this, looking for a place to dig nests. And she, see, here she's over a ledge, and she's not going to dig into that, so she's going to keep going until she finds sand or gravel. Then they dig holes in the gravel and then they she puts down eggs and he fertilizes them. so the i made charts distinguishing between were they doing traveling were they digging or were they actually laying eggs so here they're traveling one going east and one going west here are two traveling pairs And the single, uh, I can't tell if it's a male or a female, and a mate pair. But look at the, how do you lay eggs in little pebbles like that? That's really difficult. So I keep asking, why are they here? This guy is another male, it's not a female, and he has a good chance of fertilizing her eggs. 
because he's in the vicinity. So that's a useful place to be. So you see them in pairs, triplets, sometimes quadruplets, or masses of males around one single female. Yes. Your first picture, beginning with slideshow, had a big font. And they, they later come apart, came apart, and it was a female and a male last on to a female and two males. And I don't know why they got together, but they were linked together. But the female was not clasping, so it was just an illusion that they were together. And I haven't longed to make it eternal by taking the picture. Okay, what's this one doing? You can see the mud being cast up. Look, here she's found a spot where between the boulders there is gravel and even some sand where she can dig a nest. So that's a pair. Uh, you can't tell it, but it's a pair. There is a pair. And you can see coming out from under her shell is the streams of muddy, you know, there's, there's clay in this too. And they discolor the water around them when they're really, mm. really digging. So she's not traveling, she's actually digging. And the female has muscles on her, which she can't get off, so she just puts up with it. And here, they're actually nesting. This is a typical formation. You don't see it very often, but it is typical around the world that they will come in from the water to the land, find gravel, leave it, dig a nest, and there's a nest there, there's another nest there, and there's a third nest right there. So it's a very efficient use. Once you get the gravel, you get the most out of it, and you deposit several hundred eggs, you know, there and there and there. And then they leave and go on. And I don't know how many times she can do that, but uh, there, she had more eggs than she could get rid of in three, three shots. So here's the female buried down digging, and the male latch on behind, nesting, nesting. And here's male, 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 female. And they're all genetically, the probability is they all have an equal chance because they're all the same distance from where she lays the egg. Steve, is it just the female that does all the work with digging and traveling? And lugging around? That's oh. right. It's just like in the real world. It's the so women who wash the dishes. Now, this is an interesting, I don't know if you can see this ridge here. Male, male, underneath, totally invisible, buried in the stone, is a female. And they both are going to fertilize her egg. And then she appears with the rocks on her and moves on. This one is still attached, and that one is kind of riding a side saddle. So, in this chart, blue is the ones I saw on that day traveling, digging are the yellow ones, and nesting are the red ones. So, here is the height, this one day is the height of the breeding season. And why is that? It's because the temperature, this line is the temperature. They just, when the temperature is 56 degrees, they begin to nest. They won't nest below that. So here it is, uh, this is the equivalent of 56 degrees Fahrenheit. Comes up, first warm day, they really get out. Here, just at the first beginning of the season, they come out. But then it cools down and their breeding numbers cool down. And then after that, the temperature doesn't have any difference because they've sown all their eggs.
So they're very anxious, temperature sensitive. And here are 2005, 2006. You can see the temperature is high during the time when their activity is high. The temperature drops down and their activity drops down. Temperature rises up, they rise up. Temperature drops. And then this year, 2006, it's exactly the same. Temperature's high and they're active. Temperature's high and they're active. And this one day, the temperature is lower, so they're not active. more information here than I want to go into. I did bottom temperature uh, thermometer readings. Here is zero degrees centigrade and the ice in the winter is a little warmer than freezing. And then as I showed you in the chart for the season, here's fall with the freezing temperature, here's winter with the level temperature. Spring rising up in summer when it's all warm, around 70 and above. And this was a wall when the temperature declined in June in the horseshoe crabs. Like to have it up there, but the east wind coming out the Gulf of Maine lowered the temperature, and we had a whole three week period when it was colder than usual, and the horseshoe crabs just held. We waited till that was over. Here you see the nest. When the tide is right and the tide is coming in, you can see a nest there, nest there, nest there, the nest there, and the nest there. And the Young have to leave the nest when they hatch in a tide just like this when there's water. And they can grow in the dampness of the high tide, uh, even though there's no water. But when they depart, they go into the world just like that. And you see, it's damp. The sun has dried the surface, but underneath it's damp. And that's required for the nest to grow the young nest. Imagine the work that she does to lay her egg. She makes it happen and it's not easy in top and day. There's an egg, there's an egg, there's an egg, there's an egg, there are two eggs. There. Like little green grapes only the size of a buckshot or something. And do they become part of the plankton population when they're really young? I mean, they're, not, they're very small, I guess, right? Or they're very small, highly vulnerable. They're laid, laid by the millions, and very few survive. So most of them get gobbled up by sandpipers and other creatures. That's a Sonar transmitter epoxy to the shell. Um, and so here's the female with that transmitter. The, you notice how dark this is. That's a sign of age. They darken with some kind of layer on them. Uh, and when you're, they're young, they're tan like a deer or something. So this is much older than this one. That's me with a sonar receiver on the end of that and a recorder to write down the position when I find one. That's Slade Moore who designed the project. He worked for the Department of Marine Resources. Here are all of the readings we had in two bays. These are all Hog Bay. These are all in Egypt. And these are miscellaneous sightings that we've had. The sea of a Bering Island, the sea in the carrying place on Hatch Point, up here on Butler Point. So my question is, is this 
from this population, and the likelihood is no, it's from this, because it can find fairly warm water all the way down here, or right there, the channel is so close, bringing in cold water, that I think that forms an isolating bridge, so they don't go, this is what keeps this population separate from that population. <coughs> And I had a thermometer there and a thermometer there to measure the temperature. So here are all the horseshoe crab readings that I found in Hog Bay. And November is red, and that's when they hibernate. So that's, or it could be that the shell was shed or the animal died, and that's where it was buried in the mud can't tell. But there's one hibernated there, and there, and there, and there, and there. And here's the motion of one. This is the only one I saw in two and a half years of monitoring. I pulled my boat up, and I was getting a very strong reading right there on the shore. I said, it's right under the boat. <laughs> so I used my oar, and I pushed off, and there it was with its tag. Uh, laying its eggs right there on the shore. Uh, and that same one hibernated there. Then in May, it got over there. Then it bred in June. Then it went around the bay, came back, and went around Round Island and hibernated there. So there's no, well, there is some continuity. It's there on the edge where there's mud in the bank of the channel. And it's a very similar spot there. And that's its world. It lives in that area. So they don't go far. They don't go out to the ocean. Here's Egypt Bay. Here's where they hibernate down in the southern end, where it's a little deeper. And then in the warmer months, it's up here. And they breed here and here and all around here. And again, here's one that hibernated right there, wandered around, wandered around, came up the whole shore, was breeding there on the shore, came around, and hibernated there, so it moved from there to there. So we have pretty good information on some horseshoe crabs. We know exactly where they travel. Now, <laughs> look at the size of that horseshoe crab. Can you see that it's bigger than this is Delaware Bay, where that's a typical female size. And I went down in uh, May of 2005 to see what it was like in a horseshoe crab country. Where the, uh, and they, they have these nice sandy beaches. Look at all that easy to, no gravel, no boulders. This is horseshoe crab heaven. And look at the muscle that's on the and your use of the tail, here it's using its tail to right itself. So it's a lever, a basic lever. It's been around for 450 million years for turning it to somehow it gets upside down. And it's obviously much more vulnerable upside down on the shore than it is with its armored shell. Find the female. There she is. All these males clustered around, drawn by her pheromone. And this might be another one. So, this is the way it is in Delaware. I never saw anything like that in Tom's Is there some kind of birth control? <laughs> 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 You're getting out of my depth. <laughs> but there she is. And the problem is, I think the females being bigger, they're caught more often. And they use them for hog bait and things down in Delaware Bay. So I'll show you how damn well, it's a bit of a damage on that one. Heavy traps were dropped down all over the bay. And 
every other horse you've got has a scar on it uh, and is living but by the grace of God. Here's a health Delaware female, which is small. There's a big foot, four and three quarters, nine and a half inches across. In Taunton Bay, here's the same foot, little tiny male. And instead of being nine inches, this is six inches. So, you know, a third smaller up here. And when they drag for these things, they have sharp tines that make these holes right through the shell. And some heavy weight crushed in the shell. And they still, you know, if it doesn't hit their vital organs, they still carry on. But it's a shock to see how wounded they are. And there's a little gravel on Delaware Bay. But they love this. This is perfect for breeding. This is the best place in, or one of the best places in Egypt Bay where there's gravel, and it's only about 10 feet block wide out of the whole bay. And then there's one beach up at the end, which is really even better than this. So that's the place I looked for breeding orchard crabs and nests. In that gravel. Down here you get cobbles and you don't find them breeding. Uh, here you find ledge and they don't breed there at all because they can't dig into it. And here is an interesting example. They will breed there right next to the rock. So here they have to probe and they go along here looking for a suitable breeding site. And there is one. They know it's there but they have to find it. Some places are sand, there's some gravel, cobbles, bigger rock, marsh grass, and they make do. And so I think ours are smaller, compact, need a shorter season, and I think they're hardier, I think they're tougher. I think they come from Maine. <laughs> Because, you know, to stay in our climate, you've got to be hardy. You have to like it. You have to know how to cross country ski and all that. And here are the epiphytes that really victimize horseshoe crabs if you get a hold on them. You get rock weed going on them, blue mussels. Here's one that's been eaten by an eagle or a raccoon or a crow or somebody flipped it upside down. There's one leg over there, there's a leg there, a leg there. It was really torn apart by something that had a strong bill, and my guess is an eagle ate the innards of all of these. And here there. There really is not a lot of flesh in them either, right? Oh, that's why people. Yeah, we that's why we haven't touched I them. I mean, if you had the legs of these, you couldn't get a bite out of any of them. Maybe you could eat the gill, I don't know, with the oxygen in that. Uh, I'm just thankful that people don't eat them. But people are curious and they pick them up by the tail and they break it off. So they suffer. Wasn't there something else called medically bad for crabs? And yes, their blood is an indicator. Uh, they have blue blood, it's based on copper, and it's used for lab tests. For American hospitals, and the testers claimed it didn't increase the mortality rate, but it does. They have found subsequently. Uh, this is a female, you can see her eggs, so there's protein in there if the predator can get at her ovaries or her tubes. So that is why I think. They are preyed upon. There's, you know, there's food value in that. And 
And this is a picture from the beach of their two biggest fans. So these guys would account for the mortality of, you know, like this. And killifish are little three inch long fish. Here's a mated pair. This is the male, and the female is up there laying her egg. And they go in under her shell to gobble the egg. So what they do is pray during the actual moment of reading, when she's laying the eggs and they're suspended in the water column, and they can get at them. So, reading horseshoe crab numbers in Egypt Bay are affected by The water temperature got to be above 56 degrees. Whether there's gravel or sand around to lay eggs in, not lay. The time of high tide, if the high tide is at noon, the sun has warmed rocks as the tide comes in in the morning, and the tide imparts that warmth to the water. So the shoreline temperature where they breathe can be toasty warm on a day when you wouldn't think they would lay. So that's a big factor. Like that ledge in the corner there would store a lot of heat. And when the tide comes in, you can see it can get up that high. That would be a factor. And if there's any gravel over there, it would make it easier. The phase of the moon, the legend is that they Read at night under the first full moon in May. In Tonson Bay, I find that not true at all. There's no correlation with the moon. It's all temperature. So the sun shines in the rocks, imparting heat to the rocks. The rocks heat the water. And the horseshoe crabs, this is a picture where it looks like there are five in a row. But those two are just incidentally, they're not really connected to those two. So that's why they're here to answer my own question, why are they here? Because shallow mud flats in Hog and Beaker Bay absorb the temperature, even though it looks inhospitable, it's what they like and they found a place to make their niche. So how are we doing on the time? Seven times. What time is it? It's three or seven.